Hi, everyone. Welcome to Denver. Beautiful night in the Rocky Mountain region. Sports Authority Field at Mile High. Getting you set for the Boston Cannons and Denver Outlaws. Mike Evans, Ron Zwerin. And Boston got a big win against Chesapeake in their last game after starting the season 0-3. Still a feeling of urgency for the Cannons. Yeah, there's no question about it, Mike. Boston does not want to go to 1-4. They can't afford to do it, especially in this league. they got to find a way to get a win tonight and try and somehow get to that 4-4 four four mark. Denver, no surprise, off to another fast start at 4-0 and led by Brendan Mundorf. Arguably an all-around force in this league. I, I couldn't agree more. I think that Brendan Mundorf, in my opinion, is the best attackman in all of LMLL. He can do it in so many different ways. He can beat you as a shooter. He can beat you as a feeder. And now he's getting that mental part of the game down pat. He is tough to beat. In that big win for Boston, uh, Ryan Boyle stepped up. No surprise veteran. And at least for the time being, the all-time leading scorer in MLL history. Ryan Boyle is just a treasure to watch. So if you're watching this game tonight on YouTube, you definitely want to pay attention to number 14. He can do so many things well. And now, as he's getting a little bit older, he's starting to become one of those cerebral players it's just an awful lot of fun to watch Denver one of the uh, forces at home usually hardly ever lose here although Boston 5-0 and lifetime at mile high cannons and outlaws coming up next game knows me inside and out it's taught me that victory is forged not just by the power of your shot has its first loss of the season but the strength of your conviction it taught me I could turn the impossible into the instinctual my story is lacrosse's story and the next chapter starts now Front. There's Lowe! He fires and scores! Kevin Lowe! Four seconds left. Inside the pass. Quinzani! He scores! Quinzani with a buzzer beater! I'm Evan Washburn, host of Inside the MLL, your home for everything Major League Lacrosse. Each week for 30 minutes, we're taking you through the league, recapping what's happened while also looking forward. Along with in-depth features, this season, more than any other year, we're bringing you the voices and faces of the game to break down the biggest storylines and also the weekend's biggest games. We really look forward to catching you all season long on CBS Sports Network. at Mile High. Cannons and Outlaws ready to get started. Mike Evans along with Ron Swearin. And right away, a chance to uh, watch these two coaches who will be squaring off. Jim Stagnita in his second year with the Outlaws, 11-3 a year ago, made it all the way to the championship game before losing to Chesapeake. And for Boston, Steve Duffy, his Cannons in the playoffs a year ago, made it to the semifinals before getting knocked off. His team off to a one and three start. Ready for the opening faceoff. A good one, Anthony Kelly and Chris Eck. And Kelly, who is the number two man in MLL, winning faceoffs, gets the opening faceoff, and we're underway. Outlaws with the ball first. Boston, the highest scoring team in MLL. Brendan Mundorf is out there along with Boston's Ryan Boyle, the two players that we highlighted in the Warrior player spotlight before the game. Denver 
taking their time. In goal is Jordan Burke, and he gets the first save as he was able to stop Denver's Drew Snyder. And Snyder was incredible in the first meeting between these two teams three weeks ago as he scored five goals. Boston back the other way. Ball loose. Schwartzman couldn't find it for a moment. Able to corral it and back the other way. Talking to Coach Steve Duffy today, he said one of the biggest keys for his team will be containing Denver's transition game. And you saw that transition right there and another save by Burke. Boston loves coming to Denver, 5-0 and here at Sports Authority Field at Mile High, a place that Denver traditionally just does not lose. In fact, since the Outlaws came into the league 22-12 and and five of those losses have come against the Cannons and right away, Boston grabbing the lead as Brent Adams gets his first goal of the season, beating Jesse Schwartzman. So fast offense from Boston from an unexpected source as we get a look here. Adams able to beat Snyder and whips it by Schwartzman. First goal of the season for Adams, 1-0. Boston with the lead. Again, the faceoff, two of the best in the league. Eck about a 50% win percentage this year at X. And a real good start this season for Kelly as he has won over 60% of his faceoffs and two for two right here. He comes all the way down and gets the goal. No Fogo there for Anthony Kelly as he picks up his third goal of the season. So not only has he been a force winning faceoffs, but he's been a threat to score right after that. Big guy, you don't want to get in the way of Kelly. All six foot four, 245 pounds of him as he rumbles down the middle and scores. Talking to Jim Stagnita today, he was really impressed by Anthony Kelly. The feeling is, is that really for the first time in his MLL career, healthy and very motivated. This is a guy who realizes that maybe only so many games left, so many years left to play lacrosse. He wants to get the most out of it and he has put all that together with his, with his overall know-how of playing the position has just been dominant thus far. We'll bring in Ron Zwerin here in just a second. 1-1, one, one, Mundorf working it around, Kiminer, Sieverts, some of the veteran players on this Outlaws team. The MLL draft recently held, some of the teams now starting to get their players, young players in. And there is Snyder with his eighth goal of the season. And Boston up 2-1. Just nice play by Snyder here. You know, he just, he just recognizes the situation and gets a little bit of time, gets a little bit of space, a little bit of space to react. Denver takes the lead. And Snyder... Big, big game against Boston. The last time these two teams played, he had five goals. Five of those eight goals on the season coming in that one game. And so he's had a nice success. And right back again is Kelly. Wow. What a story. Watching him down on the field before the game warming up, he was fired up for this game, really into it. And what a start for Kelly, not only winning faceoffs, but now two goals. Ron, this is just not something you customarily see. I mean, winning that clearly, and then who's going to get in the way of that well, rumbling train? Yeah, well, especially when he beats Chris Eck. Chris Eck, two weeks ago, was absolutely dominant at the faceoff dot. And so for Kelly to get off to such a torrid start, winning two clean and then also getting a goal, that's exactly what... Denver's looking for. Well, Chris Eck with a lot of pride. You knew that wasn't going to continue. He wins that faceoff, and Boston now able to get back on the attack with Paul Rabel. Chased down by Lee Zink, two of the really great all-time veterans in this game. 
You know, a lot of teams have been really playing Paul Rabel so tight. I think that in some cases, Mike, they've been playing him a little bit too tight. Paul Rabel has been getting knocked around an awful lot in this early going of the 2013 campaign in MLL. I think if the league wants to keep him healthy and keep their star players healthy, some of these refs are going to have to kind of step up a little bit and protect him because a lot of players are taking some extra liberties with Paul Rabel. Certainly happened a couple of weeks ago. I thought he got smacked around a little bit more than necessary. Shot clock down to six. Again, shot does not get through, and here comes down in the other way for the Outlaws. That transition attack that Boston's so much aware of. This is Chris Bocklet, who's got an astounding 15 goals through the first four games, leading goal scorer in MLL. In fact, five of the top ten scores in Major League Lacrosse involved in this game. It's Justin Turry. Sieverts, now Turry again. This top line midfield for the Outlaws has been absolutely dangerous all year long. And not only has their top line been dangerous, but their second and even their third line has been something for teams to deal with. Boston doesn't typically run as deep of a bench as Denver does, and so that might prove to be the difference maker a little bit later in the fourth quarter if legs start getting a little heavy. Oh, a crazy deflection. The goal goes in. Now, it was a two-point shot. We did hear the horn go off, but the shot had been released by Sieverts. Hit something in front. Look at this deflection. Well, he definitely shot it from outside the arc, way outside the arc. What did it hit? That's got to be a two-point goal, but they're only giving him a one point so far. As the highlight clearly showed, well beyond the, the two-point arc as he had to get the shot off before the shot clock expired. Hit something in front, Jordan Burke caught leaning one way and helpless as the ball got behind him. We'll see if they go back and take a look at that. As uh, right now they're looking at the highlight to determine whether or not it was a, well, clearly it was a two-point goal or two-point shot attempted. And it is a two-point goal. Okay, two-point shot, two-point goal for Jeremy Seaver. It's only the second two-point goal of the year for the Outlaws. Highest scoring in MLL, highest scoring team, but only their second two-point goal and that was really wasn't by design that wasn't just a two-point shot that was a three-point shot I mean he took that from way behind the arc so a quick start for the outlaws who are up 5-1 and a turnover Picked up by the Outlaws, and here they come again looking to attack. This is a team that has always used Ron playing at altitude so much to their advantage. They certainly have, Mike, and you know, they look a little bit faster to me than I've seen them look in the last couple of years. I mean, they look like they're getting out and they're running a lot faster. They're running a lot of lines, and they're sort of running the kind of transition style that you see in indoor lacrosse. Outlaws content to make those opposing defenses work. And another goal as the Outlaws hitting on all cylinders here to start this game. Chris Bocklet with his league leading 16th goal of the season. And the Outlaws now up 6 1. This is just a heads up look because as the feed comes in front, it looks like Smalley just lost his man. 
Fast start for the Outlaws. They're up on Boston, 6-1. We'll come back to Sports Authority Field in Denver here in just a moment. Last pick in the 2004 draft, Mr. Irrelevant is what they called me. They said I should just be honored to be drafted since I was a Division III player. But they don't know me. I don't do honored, and I certainly don't do irrelevant. Berger shoots, and he scores! I'm Steven Berger of the New York Lizards, and I powered through to become the 2012 MLL All-Star Game MVP. How do you power through? to Denver 6-1 outlaws with the early lead over Boston Mike Evans and Ron Zwerin and Ron the outlaws picking right up where they left off in their last game here at home where they obliterated Rochester 20 to 7 Jim Stagnita head coach said really it was the first time this season even though they're 4-0 the first time they felt they played their most consistent game without that many lags and, yeah and to your point they picked up right where they're left off I mean they they have come out in this game, and they're not only shooting it accurately, but they're carrying the ball. And I think that, you know, as you look at Kelly at the faceoff dot, he won two clean, gave him two goals off of that. Chris Eck has sort of kind of righted the ship a little bit for Boston, but I think Dever getting off to that big start is certainly one of those things that Boston wasn't exactly hoping for coming into this game. They kind of want to keep it closer if Boston can. They want, they want to kind of grind Denver down especially with someone like Paul Rabel and Ryan Boyle. Both those players getting touches. And now, oh, hitting the post was Will Manny, the rookie from UMass, looking for his first career goal, almost got it. But Jesse Schwartzman's not just good, a little bit of luck there for the goalkeeper. Will Manny is a nice looking player for Boston. He has an awful lot of uh, lacrosse IQ and he just, Took a little seam and went right to the rack. You like to see that out of rookies. No fear. Coming into this league, you know, it can be a little bit intimidating because these guys are, are bigger and faster and you've watched them for a number of years. And so to step in and take it right to the hoop right away with no fear is a good sign for Boston. Outlaws whipping that ball around. Oh, big save there made by Burke as Bocklet had him dead to rights. Now a flag thrown. We're going to have a penalty called against Denver. Big hit there right after the save by Burke. That'll most likely be an unnecessary roughness call because as that defenseman was about ready to catch that pass, he was completely helpless. Just got blown up by Bocklet. As we watch Rabel here, you talk so much about Boston wanting to grind, and there they get the goal. Another flag thrown right after the score by Michael Stone, who gets his sixth of the year beating Schwartzman. So we'll figure out the laundry here, but the goal for the Cannons. You know, Mike, we so much talk about how this league is a game of runs, and it can turn on a dime. And something like this can all of a sudden be the turning point. You know, you get the penalty on the other end, and then this could have been a penalty right here as a as a, as a cross check to Rabel's neck. And then right after the shot, just an unnecessary extra shove by Dylan Roy. And he'll be spending some time in the box. Okay. 
As you can see, the one minute penalty called against Dylan Roy for the unnecessary roughness hit right after the goal scored by Michael Stone. Let's take another look at that hit. Well, this is this is the this is the drive by Manny. And so that's not the penalty. That's just the so strong drive by Manny, but you know, the hit with the hit on Bocklet that Bocklet took, that was just an a late hit. Or I'm sorry, the hit on Roy was a late hit. Bocklet's hit his defenseman who he popped was just completely wide open. You know, you, 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 can't, you can't hit a guy like that in open field when he's not able to protect himself at all. Another clean win for Kelly, who instead of trying to score that time, looked to give it up as he tried to find Zach Greer, turnover, outlaws. Now back here comes Boston trailing 6-2 with about five and a half minutes left in the first quarter here at Sports Authority Field in Denver. And in lacrosse terms, this is sort of like the five on three power play in hockey. You know, you definitely, I mean, they're, they're full time penalties. So you definitely want to see how many goals you can rack up in the next minute. And scoring is Ryan Boyle on the feed from Paul Rabel. Beautiful dish from Rabel. And Ryan Boyle, the reigning MLL Player of the Week, gets the goal. Just a great look by Paul Rabel. Just no looks it right across field. Ryan Boyle takes that extra step, just gets underneath Lee Zink just enough so that he can dump it in past Schwartzman. For Boyle, his fifth goal of the season. And the penalties still continue. So still another opportunity for the Cannons to take advantage of this man up, two man up. Final five seconds of the penalty. So now the teams are at even strength. That's a win for Boston. They are one for one on the man advantage tonight. There's Ryan Boyle, who is engaged in a battle for supremacy, all-time leading scorer in Major League Lacrosse with Casey Powell for the time being, ahead of Powell. But these two could easily exchange the lead throughout the season. Shot goes wide from Matt Poske. Denver got caught chasing a little bit on that defensive set. Now they're back to their one-on-one. -on -one. Oh, big save by Schwartzman. Another save by Schwartzman as he stones Kevin Buchanan and Poske, but then the goal scored as Poske stopped once there, was able to come back and get the goal. So after a couple of big saves by Schwartzman, gave up the rebound, Boston continued to attack, and they get another goal. Denver did a good job of saving the first shot, but Poske is right there as Schwartzman's diving for the loose change in front, and Poske finds the biscuit and puts it in. So after Denver jumped out to a 6-1 lead, Boston's answered with the last three. It's 6-4 Denver. You're watching Major League Lacrosse, presented by Warrior. I'm Evan Washburn, host of Inside the MLL, your home for everything Major League Lacrosse. Each week for 30 minutes, we're taking you through the league, recapping what's happened while also looking forward. Along with in-depth features, this season, more than any other year, we're bringing you the voices and faces of the game to break down the biggest storylines and also the weekend's biggest games. We really look forward to catching you all season long on CBS Sports Network.
left. Boyle outside the arc. Inside the pass. Quinzani. He scores! Max Quinzani with a buzzer beater. Denver Outlaws with a 6-4 lead. Beautiful night here in the uh, Rocky Mountains as the Cannons have come back with the last three goals. Take a look at the shot. Schwartzman's reaching for it. It falls just outside of the crease. And Poske had no choice but to flip it over his shoulder. Found Pater. Great awareness. Knew that Schwartzman down and out. Just wanted to just flip it towards the goal. Knew that there would be nobody there. Poske gets the goal, his sixth of the season. And this Boston team, we've seen it over the years, Ron. We've called a number of these Boston wins here in Denver. And the thing about these cannons is they never get down. They never get rattled here. A lot of teams come to Denver, they get down early. They get caught up in the pace. They get caught up in the altitude. And it really affects them and they are never able to overcome. This Boston team has shown through the years an ability to just kind of hang in there and get that game to the second half and then they find a way to win it. That's because this team is gritty. I, I really like this version of the Boston Cannons. You know, that game that they played a couple weeks ago against Chesapeake, I was really impressed with how they fought all game long. It was a tight game all game long. It wasn't quite as streaky as this game where Denver goes on a 5-0 run and then Boston comes back on a 3-0 run. It was more like a goal, a goal, a goal for each team. They were back and forth all game long and Boston needed that win. And tonight, they're in a situation where they need to get a win. They can't afford to lose a game and start getting further and further away from that 500 mark. So this team is definitely gritty. They're gonna give Denver all they can handle and you know they're gonna fight for four quarters. I think that the one advantage that Denver does have playing at home tonight versus other years is that I think they're a little bit deeper this year than some of the Boston teams we've seen in the past. Down to the final, two minutes and change here in the first quarter. Getting knocked down, Mundorf, who's been held in check thus far. And coming away is the Outlaws. Oh, another post hit, that time by Zach Greer. And down and shaken up is Drew Snyder. We'll get an official stoppage here. You, you wonder, Ronnie, the way he's got that left leg out, maybe a cramp playing here at altitude. Yeah, it could be a cramp, but the look on his face might suggest otherwise. And they seem to be checking his knee. Right before that, Zach Greer rang the post. It's behind Jordan Burke. All eyes right now as we've got a stoppage as attending to Drew Snyder, second year player out of Maryland. Now you might be right, it might have just been a cramp. Maggie Yates, the, the trainer for the Denver Outlaws, does a fabulous job with the guys on this team. Good to see Snyder running off the field. Let's get a look at what happened. Yeah, yeah he just cramped yeah, up. He cramped right. up, yep. Dr. Evans gets it right once again. Well, you know, I got a good night's sleep last <laughs> night, so I'm <laughs> on Express. top of my game. Watch a lot of medical shows too, so. I know the signs when I see it. <laughs> Back in uh, underway here, here's Brendan Mundorf. Terry Kiminer. Another save made by Burke. Burke showing no ill effects after spending the last couple of weeks on injured reserve. Has come out sharp tonight. And Gable filled in well in his stead was the, was the goalie for the win over Chesapeake a couple of weeks ago. He played solid in that game, but Burke's their guy. And Coach Duffy made no bones about it before the game. He said, Burke's our guy, we're going with him, and we're not hesitating about that at all.
Yeah, what's that old saying, I guess, in lacrosse? If you have two goalies, you, you have none. And yeah. And Burke is their guy, and he'll be their guy here moving forward. Shot score by Matt Poske as he gets his second, rifling it past Schwartzman. And Boston now within one. I think the timing of that just sort of threw Jesse off just a, just a click. And in this league, that's all you need is just a little bit of a click. You know, Poske has been the beneficiary of a couple of lucky pops coming his way. Balls just sort of bounced right in his stick. And on this, on this drive right here, you're going to see the ball all of a sudden just sort of get high, ends up in Poske's stick. Schwartzman's not really seeing where it's coming from. There are three guys screening Schwartzman. And all of a sudden, Boston's within one. You're right about the lucky nature of that play as you had Adams looking like he was looking for Stone and Stone unable to come away with it and came right to Poske, who was in position to rifle it past Schwartzman. Shot clock is off. Outlaws can play for the final look. Down to 10 seconds. Oh, and good double team sneaking up on Justin Pennington unaware knocked away and that'll do it for the first quarter oh a final shot there right at the end as boston was able to quickly advance it entertaining really two stories within that first quarter Bo uh, denver early on jumped out to the 6-1 lead and then boston comes back over the last part of the first uh, quarter to make it a one goal game 6-5 after the first quarter more action from denver coming up next it's major league lacrosse presented by Brian. Denver as we get set for the second quarter. Denver up 6-5 over Boston. Great to have you with us. Major League Lacrosse on YouTube brought to you by Warrior. Visit warrior.com. Also, Brine. Visit brine.com. Official equipment providers for Major League Lacrosse. Mike Evans, Ron Swearin. Entertaining first quarter of lacrosse. No question about it. Just a good old fashioned battle between Boston and Denver. You know, it's kind of like the good old days, Mike. You know, we would call these games back in the day for the last few years. Boston's found a way to come and get a win. 
here in Denver, but these games are always entertaining because these two teams, I think, genuinely don't really like each other very much. And so because there's kind of like that disdain between each other, you get a good gritty battle. Steve Duffy was talking about that today, how Boston loves coming to play here. They love the atmosphere. They love playing in the big stadium. And you're right. These two teams, the players, they've known each other for a long time. They've competed with and against each other. There's a healthy rivalry, a healthy respect. And, you know, two teams who have been the two best teams in Major League Lacrosse throughout the years in the regular season, the top two winning teams in Major League Lacrosse. So every time they get together, it's always a good matchup, especially since Denver won in Boston just three weeks ago. And the matchups within the game are fabulous. Like this one right here with Brendan Mundorf against Mitch Belisle. It's just a great matchup. And there's Mundorf just as he was knocked into the crease. He's able to get the shot off and beat Jordan Burke. And that's really Mundorf at his best, being able to win that one-on-one -on -one matchup. And this is the reason why I think that he is the most complete attackman in all of Major League Lacrosse because his moves are not the same every single time. Sometimes he'll come up and take you and get a question mark move on you. Other times he'll, he'll post you up, right goal line extended. And right as he gets about to the crease line, he just sacrifices the body. But he's so patient. He has learned as the years have gone by how to angle his body, how to give, him space, give himself some space, and he can also create some time to get off good shots because he's a patient player. And for Mundorf, that's his eighth goal of the season. Mundorf leads the Outlaws, all time leading Outlaws scorer in goals, assists, and points. When you look at his name in the Denver Outlaws media guide, it's just first, 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 first. I mean, he is number one in just about every single statistical category for this team. Oh, what a move. Zach Greer with a little shoulder shimmy to get by his man and then blows it by Burke. There's something really special about watching Canadian players come out and play in the outdoor league because their indoor skills really shine. I mean, this is an indoor player, primarily Zach Greer, and look how he just uses his entire body to give a body fake up high like he's going to shoot. And that makes the defense pause, get on their heels for just a split, split second. And then he's quick enough that he can get by a guy and get a good shot off. It's fun to watch. For Greer, his fifth goal of the season and a game of runs. Denver had a 6-1 lead. Boston cut it to 6-5. And now the Outlaws with the first two goals of the second quarter. back to Boston and their approach about coming here to Denver. You know, this is a team that started the season 0-3 and, and Coach Duffy telling me today that Boston's a team that really thrives off urgency. That, that feeling that, hey, we gotta really rise up here. Schwartzman with the save and they, they felt it in that game against Chesapeake. They'd fallen to 0-3. Here they were getting the defending champs. They rose to the occasion. They won that game. Now out here in Denver with a challenge of playing a really good Outlaws team. The kind of games that the outlaw, that the uh, Cannons seem to feed off of. Because they have a nice blend of veterans and young players. And the veterans really lead the way and set the tone for the young players. Let them know what's expected of them week in and week out. You gotta stay in shape on those off weeks. You gotta make sure that when you get two weeks off like all of MLL did pretty much for the most part in the bye week last week, that you come into mile high and that you're in shape because you know you have to run for four quarters at altitude. Downing shot goes wide. Ron referencing the bye week in deference to the NCAA championship weekend. Congratulations to Duke national champions, beating my alma mater, the Cuse. Did you have to grit your teeth when you oh, said that? Oh, man, Syracuse. Come on, Cuse. Win a face-off, will you? <laughs> what was it, 13 in a row at one point, Duke won? Good stuff. Another great Final Four of lacrosse, college lacrosse. And now some of these rookies, some of these guys that college fans had a chance to watch throughout the year. In fact, uh, Boston has four 
of their draft picks. And one of them, Cameron Flint, played for DU in the Final Four with the ball right now. And Cameron Flint, I think, is going to be a nice addition to this Boston Cannons team in the next couple of years. He's one of the best midfielders in all of college lacrosse this past year. And I think that if he can step up, Mike, and be the kind of player, an impact player, to take some of that pressure away from Paul Rabel, oh, man, he can start opening up a lot of things for Boston. Cameron Flint certainly has the skill set to do it. And right now they're running him on the field with Paul Rabel, and they're ISOing him. You talked with one of the Boston coaches before the game and said, you asked him, were we going to see Flint? And he said, absolutely, throw him in there. This is his hometown. See what he can do. Short bus ride. Yeah. That's a really good play by Schwartzman as he came out and took away all the angle. Stone got a little cute on that. He had too many options, too much time sometimes. Here's a great matchup right here. You want to talk about one of the all-time great one-on-one -on -one matchups, Ryan Boyle against Lee Zink. And, and the reason why, I, mean, I know that, was, that didn't really live up to the billing, but watch it throughout the night because these two guys are really tacticians at their position. Lee Zink, he's not going to beat you up or, you know, be more physical than you, but he will out finesse you. He will out position you. And Ryan Boyle is the same way. He's not going to out muscle you all game long, but he will outthink you and he'll get his, himself in good positions and he'll make his teammates get in good positions so he can find them and give them some time and some space to get good shots off. Lee Zink, the reigning MLL Defensive Player of the Week, as he absolutely shut down Ned Crotty in their last matchup. In fact, Jim Stagnita telling me today he knows Crotty pretty well. And he talked to Crotty as the shot goes wide. And Crotty said, Coach, I, I just can't beat him. He gets better and better every year, talking about Zink. Yeah, and you know, it's funny. A couple of years ago, he was thinking about retiring. Oh, what a move. Oh, again, another terrific individual move. That time by Justin Turry, again, using the shoulder fake to beat his man, got a good look, shot went wide, stays with the Outlaws with Mundor. You know what I like about what Jim Stagnita and Denver is doing right now? They are allowing the players, they're allowing the Denver Outlaw players to talk to them about using certain kinds of play sets. In that last set, which was interesting, as Rabel gets the shot off, what was interesting about that last set, Mike, is that they put Greer and Mundorf up top as midfielders, and they let them run a little two-man game like they run in the indoor league. That's not something you normally see out of an Outlaws team. They like to run it from the top with their midfielders and keep their attackmen behind. Buchanan falls down, back up. In the win against Chesapeake two weeks ago, I thought Kevin Buchanan was the best player on the field for the first three quarters of the game. Just a fabulous player in that game. He made so many smart decisions and had some really good timely goals. Rabel throws it away, and we've got a timeout here on the field. 8-5, Denver with the only two goals here of the second quarter. We'll come back to Sports Authority Field at mile, here, mile, mile High as you are watching Major League Lacrosse, the Major League Lacrosse game on YouTube, being brought to you by Warriors. Gurenly down on the turf after trying the second swim move. This is not how I wanted to end my lacrosse career. I always thought I would go out on my terms. Everyone said I should just call it quits. It would be too hard to come back. But I didn't listen to everyone. I powered through. Gurenly in charging and he scores! The beast! I didn't just come back. I was a 2012 MLL All-Pro. I'm Greg Gurenly of the New York Lizards. How do you power through? on the split dodge, right in, he scores! Waleed Hodge wins it for the Young Guns. In 
front. There's Lowe. He fires and scores. Kevin Lowe. Four seconds left. Inside the pass. Quinzani. He scores. Quinzani with a buzzer beater. Back here in Denver, Outlaws on top of the uh, Cannons by the score of eight to five. Lacrosse fans, here's your chance to see all the best players in the world in one place. The 2013 Major League Lacrosse All-Star Game presented by Moe's Southwest Grill is July 13th in Charlotte, North Carolina. The top 40 players in Major League Lacrosse will face off in the game and don't miss the skills competition at halftime featuring the fastest shot and freestyle competitions. For tickets and information, visit MajorLeagueLacrosse.com. Mike Evans, Ron Zwerin, with this Major League Lacrosse game on YouTube, presented by Warrior and Brine. Outlaws with the 8-5 lead, only two goals of this second quarter. So often, Ron, when these two teams get together, it's about pace and who's been able to dictate thus far. I think it's been pretty even, you know, because we've had two different runs. And so during that first run where Denver went off on that 5-0 run, they were certainly dictating pace. They were playing a little bit more aggressive. And then Boston kind of snapped out of their funk and kind of got their altitude legs about them and started dictating some pace as well. But so far in the last couple of minutes, it certainly has been Denver. So again, it's been sort of like this moment of flow. Denver's been having some, some nice pace and then Boston's kind of come back a little bit and now Denver's dictating. 15 seconds left on the shot clock. Sieverts fires, gobbled up by Burke, and here come the cannons the other way in transition. That was a great play by Dylan Roy to knock that pass down, headed for Buchanan out of the air. And Buchanan knocking down Roy, so possession stays with the Outlaws. You know, as you watch Dylan Roy play close D, he started playing a little close D for the Outlaws last year, number 91 for the Denver Outlaws. He has really stepped up his game and he's really matured into a very strong, solid number two defenseman. And I can tell you this, if he was playing for a couple of other teams in the league, he'd be their number one defenseman. He's that good. Bocklet shut off by Burke. Bocklet showing no or make that, excuse me, Drew Snyder uh, showing no ill effects from the cramp that he got a little bit earlier that forced him out of the game. Good burst there, stopped by Burke. Now Buchanan and Dylan Roy squaring off again. Colin Briggs. Shadowed there by Pennington. Colin Briggs originally drafted by the Outlaws played just a little bit about a half a season as rookie year here and then he was dealt off to the cannons. Pennington still playing following Briggs. Shot clock down to 12. Now Rabel. Checked by O'Doherty. Down to four. Rabel's gonna have to get it away. And will not. Great defense. Oh, big collision there. The shot clock had expired, so they just let that roll, and Schwartzman did a smart job. He knew that Paul was going to dive at the end of that, and he knew the shot clock had expired, so he just got the heck out of Dodge and ran away from that crease so he couldn't get in harm's way. Denver's defense really stepped up on that last set. They played man-to-man, -man, but I think that you know, as you start looking at Colin Briggs, he's now entering, you know, his second year here in Major League Lacrosse. He's going to have to start figuring out that you oh. can't. We'll let you finish that point, Ron. I, I, sorry, I just, what a move. What a shot by Greer just inside the two-point arc as he gets his second goal of the game, and the Outlaws now up 9-5. No problem. It was actually a, a shocking little move. All of a sudden, Greer just whips a, whips a little bit low to low burner right by Burke. Deceiving. So with that, Outlaws dominating this second quarter. 
as they have scored all three goals here. They've bumped their lead up to a three, make that four. As we continue on from Denver, Outlaws up on Boston, 9-5. ShopMLL.com is your destination for officially licensed Major League Lacrosse apparel. Get all your MLL team hats, t-shirts, shorts, hoodies, and more at ShopMLL.com. Keeping up with Major League Lacrosse has never been easier. Get all the latest news, highlights, and scores right to your smartphone with the MLL app for iPhone and Android. Download yours today. on the split dodge, right in, he scores! Waleed Hodge wins it for the Young Guns! Outlaws up on Boston 9-5, 2013 Major League Lacrosse Championship Weekend presented by SmartLink will be held in Philadelphia the weekend of August 24th and 25th. See the top four teams in the league battle in three games over two days to decide an MLL champion. For tickets and information, visit MajorLeagueLacrosse.com. And both these teams were involved in championship weekend a year ago. Boston losing in the semifinals. Denver with a Remarkable comeback in the semifinal game that seemed to leave them with uh, no legs in the championship game as they lost to Chesapeake 16 to six. And Ron for Boston, it's for Denver rather, it's kind of the you know familiar story. They dominate during the regular season. They're the winningest team in Major League Lacrosse in the regular season since they've entered the league back in 2006. Seven straight winning seasons, seven trips to the postseason, but only four playoff wins. They're gonna have to figure that out. And I and I know that's something that is on the minds of everybody who is associated with this organization here in Denver. Goal scored by Boston's Michael Stone, his second of the game, first of the quarter for the Cannons. That ends a 3-0 run by the Denver Outlaws. Just a nice little move, just kind of just weaves his way inside. Gets his hands free just long enough. Stone gets a big goal for Boston. You know, Denver is sort of in this situation now where, you know, it, it's it's fine to have a good regular season because that's what brings the fans out. They want to do that, but they certainly need to find a way to get over the hump in championship weekend. And, you know, it's one of those things when you talk to the players and you talk to the coaches, they, they all say, you know, if we if we had the answer, we would have done it by now. And so it's just not that easy to win in this league. It's hard. I mean, look at Boston. You know, you'd think Boston's one of the one of the better teams in this league that they wouldn't be at one and three coming into this game. But it's tough to get a win in this league. You're just a little bit off your game, and other teams will certainly take advantage of it. Denver is 64 and 26 since joining MLL. That's, That's a, a 70, 71% winning percentage. I mean, you would take that every day of the week and twice on Sunday. I mean, you'd have no problem with that winning percentage. If someone said you're going to win over 70% of your games for your entire existence in MLL, you'd think that there would be a championship on the mantle. It just isn't that easy to figure out. And every year, Mike, has always been something else. You know, an injury like last year to Brendan Mundorf that really sort of kind of changed the dynamic of the team. A couple of other years, guys just sort of ran out of gas towards the end of the year, got dehydrated. Another shot clock violation. Down to two minutes left here in the first half. Coming up at halftime, our halftime show will include Warrior. Oh, what a shot! Wow, a bullet from out top from Justin Turry. 
two-point goal for Turi. And just like that, the Outlaws into double figures. Nobody picks up Turi or Roy, and Turi says, all right, if no one's going to screen me and no one's going to get in my way, I'll just give it a roll because he had plenty of backup. So if he bounces it and it goes high, no worries. You get the ball back, get a reset. Through the first four games, Denver undefeated but only had one two-point goal. Two two-point goals in this game tonight, one from Sieverts and that one right there from Turi. And another face-off win by Kelly. Ferguson's a nice-looking rookie for the Denver Outlaws. They've got no problem putting him in the in the lineup tonight, although there are other two rookies, Landon Carr, Eric Law, as well as Brian McGill, their top draft pick out of Syracuse. They are active, but they're not playing tonight. Just coming off of that championship weekend, a Law and McGill, Law for DU and McGill for Syracuse. Denver wants to give them a little bit of a rest. It's interesting in this league, Mike, you know, more and more, no matter what league, rookies are expected to come in and perform because the timeline to cultivate players is short in professional sports. It doesn't matter what the league, and MLL is certainly no different. Says something about the caliber of play at the college level that these players are able to, literally a week or two after their college careers end, step right up and play with guys like Rabel and Zink and you know, veterans who've been in this league for eight, nine, 10 years. That play by Zink as he came from the weak side slide when Stone turned around to shut off his angle of attack was the reason why Lee Zink is just one of the great players in this league. His heads up, great timing. Denver's defense has been rock solid in this second quarter. I don't know what Coach Stagnita said to them between the first and second quarter when Boston was on that 3-0 run. But whatever it was, it certainly worked. Sievert's shot goes high down to four seconds left. Here comes Mundorf. Going to get one last look. And there's the horn. We'll hear from Jim Stagnita here in just a moment. Also, halftime, the Warrior 5 questions segment. Always entertaining. We'll talk to Jesse Schwartzman, Outlaws goalkeeper there. Jeremy Sievert's had a two-point goal. Part of a... Good all-around performance from Denver. Six goals in the first quarter, five points here in the second. They lead Boston 11 to six. Paul Rabel and the Cannons will regroup. They've been in this situation before, down at the half. Five and oh, perfect record here. Let's go down to the field. Jim Stagnita is with us, and Coach Ron was just asking the question, what was the message to your team First quarter to second quarter defensively. Well, we, we, we slowed down a little bit on the slides. Uh, we certainly have a lot of respect for, for Paul and, and the athleticism in their midfield. Uh, we were stepping into Jason uh, a little too many, a little too early and a little too often. Uh, we held up the slides a little bit and uh, it's, uh, you know, it's helped us settle down a little bit in the six on six. We were a little, I, I felt like we were creating offense for them by taking off a little bit early and stepping into Jason. And we seem to have cleaned that up a little bit more in the second quarter. Coach, in the offseason, you told me that you wanted to get bigger and stronger at the midfield line, right up the middle. You certainly have done that. And these guys look a lot faster. Are you impressed with just how well they've been playing in the early part of the season, especially the speed? You know, I, I like what we're doing right now. Uh, I thought we played well last week. You know, we got a whole half here left against a really talented team. Um, but, you know, I, I certainly, you know, we're going to come out of the, we'll come out of halftime. And, you know, we know we still got a battle on our hands. Um, we could talk about how uh, what I think about our guys after the game. All right, Coach, thank you very much. All right, guys. Jim Stagnita, head coach of the Denver Outlaws, his team up on Boston 11-6 at the half. Our halftime show which will feature highlights as well as our Warrior 5 questions with Outlaws goalkeeper Jesse Schwartzman is coming up next. This Major League Lacrosse game on YouTube being brought to you by Warrior, proud to be the official equipment, footwear, and apparel supplier of MLL. Visit warrior.com today. Warrior, cross the line.
back to Sports Authority Field. It's halftime. Outlaws in the Boston Cannons joined by goalkeeper Jesse Schwartzman. And once again, Outlaws off to a fast start. You seem to do that every year. How do you explain the quick starts to seasons? Uh, par partially coaching, partially the guys on the team. We're uh, another year together with uh, most of the core group. And uh, we haven't hit our stride by any means, and we're not where we want to be yet, but we're playing some good ball right now. All right, I know this is something you look forward to every year. It's Warrior 5 questions, so let's get to it. As a goalie, you have to yell at people a lot, constantly. Who do you enjoy yelling at the most? Uh, probably Lee Zink and Dylan Roy, the two quietest kids on the team. It's fun yelling at them. Did they ever yell back at you? No, they know better. <laughs> Goalie gets final say. Correct. All right. Goalies are always known to be a little strange, a little superstitious. Do you have any? I just uh, run out to the goal a certain way before the game. I tap the pipes a certain way before the game. Besides that, nothing really. Have you talked to other goalies or noticed other goalies who have a superstition that really blows your mind? Uh, my, my brother's goalie at Maryland used to sprinkle some dust on the pipes as they were his friends. So whatever, whatever flows your boat, you know? A little magic dust for the pipes for the goalkeeper. You're now a grizzled veteran, eight years in the league. As a kid, who was your sports idol? Uh, in sports altogether, probably Michael Jordan, just the, the way he performed on the big stage and just cool, calm under pressure. And then in lacrosse world, Brian Doherty. I think we kind of play similar. we got similar styles. You're big on Twitter, Shorty19, if you want to follow Jesse. Do you have anybody famous following you? <laughs> you got to look up my followers. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm sure there's one or two, though. You got to say something provocative to get somebody famous to follow. <laughs> exactly. So. All right, last question. It's a good one. We'll kind of play back to the future type thing. If adult Jesse could give advice to kid Jesse, what would it be? <laughs> have fun, stay in school. <laughs> Stay out of trouble. Stay out of trouble, the basics. All right, that's the Warrior 5 questions with Jesse Schwartzman. We'll be back to halftime here at Sports Authority Field with the highlights coming up next. I'm Evan Washburn, host of Inside the MLL, your home for everything Major League Lacrosse. Each week for 30 minutes, we're taking you through the league, recapping what's happened while also looking forward. Along with in-depth features, this season, more than any other year, we're bringing you the voices and faces of the game to break down the biggest storylines and also the weekend's biggest games. We really look forward to catching you all season long on CBS Sports Network. ShopMLL.com is your destination for officially licensed Major League Lacrosse apparel. Get all your MLL team hats, t-shirts, shorts, hoodies, and more at ShopMLL.com. Keeping up with Major League Lacrosse has never been easier. Get all the latest news, highlights, and scores right to your smartphone with the MLL app for iPhone and Android. Download yours today. Seconds left. Boyle outside the arc. Inside the pass. Quintani. He scores. Max Quintani with a buzzer beater. Halftime in Denver. The Outlaws with 11 to 6 lead over Boston. Thanks so much for joining us here on YouTube. Mike Evans along with Ron Swearin. 
Let's check out some of the highlights from a back and forth first half, Ron, in which the story early on was Anthony Kelly at X. Yeah, Anthony Kelly was just doing a fabulous job. He got two goals off of clean face-off wins, and Denver got off to a torrid start. You know, they started off with five straight goals, and then all of a sudden Boston came rolling back, and Boston went on a five-goal run of their run of their own. But the second quarter was really dominated by the Denver Outlaws. They outscored Boston five to one, and I think any time that Denver can go on a 5-0 run and put a team down 11-6 at halftime, that's pretty tough. Tough, tough situation for Boston here in the third quarter. Keep in mind, though, even though Denver has the lead, Boston 5-0 lifetime here in Denver. So you know this Cannons team prepared to come back and make a game of it in the second half. We've got the second half for you. Coming up next from Denver, stay tuned. This Major League Lacrosse game on YouTube is brought to you by Warrior. Proud to be the official equipment, footwear, and apparel supplier of the MLL. Visit warrior.com today. Warrior, cross the line. And by Brine. Proud to be the official equipment supplier of the MLL. Visit brine.com today. Brine, every victory earned. Beautiful. Late spring, early summer evening here in Denver, Colorado, under the bright lights at Sports Authority Field at Mile High. Home to the Denver Broncos, but tonight home to the Denver Outlaws. And Ryan Boyle and the rest of the Boston Cannons staring at an 11-6 deficit here as we get ready to start the third quarter. Mike Evans and Ron Zwerin here with you. After an entertaining first half between these two rivals, the teams with the two best records in Major League Lacrosse going back over the last seven years. And we're getting set for the second half. Ron, recapping the, the first half, what stood out to you for this uh, 
this Denver team that came in leading the league in scoring. We'll get to that here in just a second, but joining us right now is Boston's head coach, Steve Duffy. And uh, coach, you were in it 6-5 after the first quarter. How did things get away maybe a little bit in that second quarter? Well, you know, I think offensively we, we need to play a little bit better, uh, move the ball, get a lot of touches. Uh, we, you know, we were a little stagnant, guys standing still on offense, and we've got to uh, correct that a little bit. Coach, as you start looking into this uh, third quarter, are, are, do you tell your guys how important getting a win here is tonight, or do you just sort of focus on just some of the little things, or are these guys kind of looking at the big picture? You know, they know. They know how important this game is, so we just fo focus on the little things uh, to get things done. Coach, thank you very much. Thank you. Steve Duffy, head coach of the Boston Cannons, joining us as we get set to get underway here. And what does Boston need to do to get back into this game in this third quarter? I think they just need to be a little bit more patient offensively. You know, they've had a few lucky goals that kind of some fortunate bounces that came their way by Posque, the guy you're looking at right there, number seven. Got a few lucky pops that came his way, was able to capitalize on those. I think that if Boston can just kind of slow things down a little bit, because remember, Boston is not running the same kind of bench that Denver is running. They're really running a midfield and a half with their transition players, whereas Denver is running two, almost two and a half midfield lines. And so I think that if Boston can slow things down a little bit, they can get right back in it. Remember, an 11 to six lead is really not that much in Major League Lacrosse with a half of lacrosse to play. However, if there has been a problem for Boston consistently through the first four games, Defensively, they've been giving up a lot of goals, a lot of points, uh, an average of almost 15 per game. And that is something that they're going to have to address here already giving up 11 in that first half. I think faceoffs are going to be another thing we're going to watch. You know, the faceoffs were really close in the first half. Uh, Denver won 8 of 17 and Boston won just one more, 9 of 17. So, you know, you, you look, you look at these two guys, I mean, Eck and Kelly know each other very well. And Kelly, I think, is kind of leading it right now because he has those two goals off of clean face-off wins. So I'm not saying that Eck needs to come back and get two of his own, but it certainly wouldn't hurt if he was able to come out some way and establish a few wins in a row. Another one of the things that jumped out from the Outlaws' standpoint in that first half is is their remarkable shooting efficiency i mean this is a team that came into tonight's game leading the league in shooting percentage at 37 percent last year this outlaws team set a franchise record at about 35 percent ron in that first half they converted on 44 percent of their shots were goals and remember they had two point goals as well and those are impact goals because those are game changers. You don't just get those very much in Major League Lacrosse. As we get set for the uh, start of the second half, we're looking at a number of players that could uh, very easily be involved in the All-Star game. And Lacrosse fans, your chance to see all the best players in the world in one place. The 2013 Major League Lacrosse All-Star game presented by Moe's Southwest Grill, July 13th in Charlotte, North Carolina. Top 40 players in Major League Lacrosse will face off for the game, and don't miss the skills competition at halftime featuring the fastest shot and freestyle competition. For tickets and information, visit MajorLeagueLacrosse.com. Here we go, Kelly and Eck. One by Eck. And we'll see if Boston, as they have done in five previous trips here to Denver, always seemingly able to take Denver's best shot in that first half and then grind away and make a game of it and eventually come away with the victory in the second half and usually led by Paul Rabel. Here he is. First shot bounces at the feet of Schwartzman. That was a really smart play by Zink. Didn't even go after the ball. Knew that he had Dylan Roy with him. Instead just forced his man out of the play and let Roy come up and get the ball. Young players need to know the old man ball call it. Got to know. I got man, I got ball. And Lee Zink and Dylan Roy were certainly communicating on that. Mundorf with a feed to Sieverts. Mundorf, all-time leading scorer in Outlaws history, kept in check just that one goal in the first half. Leading scores for the Outlaws. Sieverts had a two point goal. Zach Greer had two goals. 
for Boston, Matt Poske and Michael Stone, each with two goals. And we got a whistle just before the goal by Poske. They're waving it off. And Poske is saying, what for? Well, they blew the whistle before the shot. So there's no way it's a goal. They cannot call this a goal because the whistle came before the shot. And I think what they were calling was an illegal pick. The refs are gonna come and talk about it, I think. But it looked like it was an illegal pick that was set. At least that was the call on the field. Poske was wide open, all alone. Nobody was there within 15 feet. Official saying, get away, get away, let's figure this out. And this officiating crew has been together for a considerable amount of time, for many years. And so I think that there might have been an ill. I'm this not is seeing the play anything. before. I'm not seeing oh, anything yeah. there. Right there. I'm not seeing anything there. I'm not seeing any. It might have been something away from the play that we're not seeing. But, but JD Poske, is over there. Poske was set up to the left of Schwartzman for well before the rest of the play kind of eventually came down that way. But be that after, as it may. Yeah, after they talked it over, no goal. And Duffy didn't seem to be too upset about it. So obviously I think that he agreed with the call. Mundorf in his office, he loves to work from behind that cage. Here's Drew Snyder, fires and scores. Drew Snyder, who had to leave the game early with a late cramp, showing that explosive dash to the middle of the field, and he beats Burke for the goal. He just blew by Smalley, and Smalley is one of the faster players around. He just put on a two-step burst and got a couple of steps right past Smalley. Guys have been talking about how well Drew Snyder has been playing all year long, and they were getting really amped up about his play in training camp this year because he came in and it looked as though he was a little stronger, a little faster, a little quicker to react. You and I have done Outlaws games for several years now. It seems like every team has that new look, and this year what stands out, these explosive midfielders, Greer, Snyder, Turry, and they're big. I mean, these are, these are bigger guys. You know, Denver had, in the past, you know, they had the Brian Langtrees of the world. Yeah. Brian Langtree, about 5'10", 180 pounds. Uh, then they had Max Seabold, again, 5'10", about 200 pounds, but he was like a freight train. You know, they had smaller guys, more compact guys. Now they're going with big, longer, big striders. Rabel looking to get free and scores. That guy's still wow. the blueprint. He's still the blueprint. Wow. He's the blueprint for what you're looking for. That's the reason why he gets paid the big bucks in Major League Lacrosse. That's why he's on the cover of all of the lacrosse paraphernalia these days. Just a, just a nice big sweep dodge. Was able to get that by Schwartzman, his old college teammate. I know Schwartz upset about that one. I love what you said. Rabel continues to be the blueprint today, which makes you realize just how much he blew away the mold when he first came into this league. That's precisely it. I mean, nobody had seen a midfielder, a two-way midfielder, as big and as strong and as fast as Paul Rabel. I mean, he's, you know, 6'3", 220. I mean, the guy could be a middle linebacker for a lot of NFL teams, and he just keeps himself in relentlessly good shape. The guy's workouts, I mean, you can catch him on YouTube. His, his workouts are legendary. And when he came into the league, he started doing things that other guys just weren't able to do. And now other teams are saying, you know what? We need guys just like that. Talking Big to Steve Duffy this morning, Ron, it, it's funny you use some of those words because the words that Duffy used to describe Rabel, he talked about relentless, the passion for the game, the preparation that is legendary. I mean, you think about the adjectives. Adjectives can't really contain nor describe what, what Rabel's done in this league and the legacy he's left. You know, Mike, in your day job, you cover professional sports for a living. 
and you're around the Denver Broncos and around the Colorado Avalanche and the, and the Nuggets and so on and so forth. And isn't it great when you can see some of the best players who are the best at their position because they work so hard? Sieverts gets his second goal, third point of the night. And Denver has restored that five point lead, make it a four point lead at 12 8. What I like about this move from Sieverts is that the last few shots he's been shooting high to high. And this time he went high to low. Showed Burke something a little bit different. You got to change things up in this league. You can't be predictable. And that time he was anything but. Ron, just to go back to the point about Rabel, is that in talking to great athletes, as, as they get older, as the years go by, it's not that they lose their passion for the game. It's not that they have difficulty going out there on game day and playing. It's all the work that goes on in the off season. All the work that goes on during the week to get ready to play. That's what really kind of forces these guys to step away because they just can't keep up that kind of commitment. A guy like Rabel, I mean, he feeds off this stuff. Yeah, yeah, and you know, there always comes that point in a career for an older player where the grind becomes harder than the game. And Rabel is nowhere near that point, and either is Brendan Mundorf. They like the grind. Yeah, they love the they grind. They love the grind. And that's what makes him so special. A special player himself with a mile high salute. Shades of Terrell Davis after a touchdown. Terry Kiminer with his first goal of the game, eighth of the season. I don't know how he snuck this past Burke because he's coming in and he has no angle and he bounced it by Burke. But for you young players, notice how Kiminer gave him a, a stick fake. He showed his stick up high and then he yanked it down low. Didn't waste too much time, no wasted movement in that shot. Let's up that, update that score for you, it's 14-7, there you go, 14-7, as the Outlaws now with their biggest lead of the game. And I know that lacrosse is a game of runs, but Boston's gotta be careful not to let this one get too far away from them. Same thing happened against Rochester. Denver just started pulling away. And Rochester just didn't have enough firepower. The difference is Boston has plenty of firepower. Oh, that one snuck by Schwartzman. He's mad at himself. Thought he had it. Bang that left arm. You could see him favoring it. Stone gets the goal. And that is third of the game for Stone. Looked like Schwartzman had a bead on it, but it just snuck inside that left arm. You could see that he's favoring that left side. I think it hit him. I think the shot just was on him so quickly. Yeah, it got him. It got him right on oh, the right left arm. Right underneath oh, that, man. You know, that kind of fleshy part. Oh, that's that's got to sting. Well, that's you don't have that sting. fleshy bone stuff. You've got the just pipes. <laughs> yeah, that's but, right. But that's right. Some of other people. <laughs> yes, mere mortals like yourself. <laughs> <laughs> that ball would have just ricocheted if it hit you. Yes, you would have heard the ping. <laughs> <laughs> Big goal for Boston as they stop the Denver run. But another face-off win for the Outlaws and they're able to get right back on it. Here's Turry, one of those explosive midfielders that have been dominating near the top of the crease with their one-on-one -on -one moves and hard shots. Mundorf loses his guy and scores. Once Mundorf beat his guy, it's almost a, a foregone conclusion he's gonna finish off with the goal. The question just becomes at that point, how many fakes is he going to throw before he puts it in the back of the net? What I like about Brendan Mundorf is that he's been playing a lot of indoor lacrosse, is he has been able to find sweet spots, the small spots in the net. Jordan Burke sharing a feeling that many other goalkeepers around Major League Lacrosse share that feeling of hopelessness when they're one-on-one -on -one staring down Brendan Mundorf. Not going to win that battle too often. Outlaws up six, Major League Lacrosse on YouTube, presented by Brian. The game knows me, inside and out. It's taught me that victory is forged, not just by the power of your shot, has its first loss of the season. but the strength of your conviction. It taught me I could turn the impossible into the instinctual. My story is lacrosse's story. 
and the next chapter starts now. Defense isn't just body blows and big hits. It's strategic. It's cerebral. It's knowing speed is just as important as strength. It's about the defense going on the offensive. It's understanding that the team that controls the ball controls the game. It's brains and brawn. Introducing the new Cyberhead, the new generation of defensive heads. Outlaw fans, having a good night as they are seeing their team well on their way to a 5-0 start as they lead Boston 15-8. Mike Evans, Ron Swearing as we get set for the face-off. First look tonight, it's Steven Robarge working at X for the Outlaws. Stepping in for Anthony Kelly there on that face-off. Won by Chris Eck. Don't see anything wrong with Kelly as he's standing up along the uh, Denver bench. I think this lead just gives Denver the opportunity, the luxury, if you will, of being able to put Robarge out there and give Kelly a break. That's a play you don't see too often. Matt Bocklet picking Rabel's pocket. Interior passing, and Pennington had the shot that went wide back to Boston. The ball movement by Denver is just fantastic right now. They are sharing the ball, and they are moving quickly but they are, they're playing fast, but they're not playing in a hurry. You know, Mike, it's, it's, if you can tell this on YouTube, sort of the color of the screen and some of the, the ambiance around the stadium, it's different here at Mile High because they've made a lot of improvements to the stadium. New scoreboards, new shot clocks. It just improves the fan experience all the way around. Denver Broncos and oh big hit as Rabel lowered the boom on Justin Pennington. Pennington turned his head and Rabel just rocked him. Clean physical hit. That's another thing you like about Paul Rabel. He's not just flashy on this event. He'll get dirty. Let's take a look at that one. Boom. Good clean hit. Led with the shoulder, right to the chest of Pennington. All alone, oh, what a save by Burke on Bocklet, Matt Bocklet. Remember that one, and they remember that one too. Another big save, Jordan Burke keeping the cannons in the game as he stymies both Bocklet brothers, first Matt and then right there Chris. If Boston gets back into this game, remember that sequence. Ball loose in the cage, and Schwartzman able to come away with it. Boy, here comes that relentless Denver attack, and the easy goal. Greer with the hat trick now. Burke was just powerless. It was just too much of an onslaught. I think that Boston's in a situation where they might want to call a timeout because Denver is running on them and Boston is trying to play Denver's game in the third quarter. That just won't work. Denver will get out and run. They want to run. They have numbers here. So this is kind of easy picking for, for Greer, who's just sitting on the doorstep. I think Boston needs to slow things down a little bit. I mean, you're only down eight. You're only down eight. But I do think you have to kind of be careful here. How long did that transition take? Maybe six seconds? Maybe. Maybe four. 
from Schwartzman all the way down. I mean, it starts with the outlet pass, right? I mean, Schwartzman is just money on those outlet, outlet passes. But these guys are just sharing the ball. It's kind of fun lacrosse to watch. And there's Pasque for a moment stopping the Denver momentum as Pasque gets the goal for him, his third of the goal. So both Pasque and Stone now with three goals apiece for the Cannons, who still find, find themselves down seven. Nice shot by Pasque. He's been the beneficiary of two bounces that have been fortunate to find his stick. And that was just a great feed by Crossfield feed found Pasque wide open. But this is where the veteran experience of the Cannons will be tested because it, it, it's still a lot of lacrosse left to be played. And you're right, they're only down seven. But it takes a, a pretty experienced team to be able to kind of hang in there under this up-tempo attack from the Outlaws. And it's also where the youth of Denver will be tested because you know that Boston, with their veteran leaders, they'll be patient and they will capitalize on opportunities. I mean, Boston hasn't made mistakes tonight. They've just been outrun a little bit so far. Boyle and Zink. And so far, Lee Zink, once again, shutting down another top scorer in MLL. Here's Rabel, all alone. And Jesse Schwartzman upset. You cannot leave Paul Rabel alone like that. Well, I don't really like that matchup of Turi on Rabel. That is a huge mismatch. That is something that Turi is not going to win very often because Rabel just loses his body, gets leverage on Turi, and Turi just loses his balance. I think that Denver's gonna have to slide a long stick up to Rabel. Usually, Denver puts Matt Bocklin on Rabel. They were college roommates. They know each other well. But in this case, you get a short stick on Rabel, and all of a sudden, it's just a six goal lead. Two goals in a row scored by Boston. And here come the Cannons. Denver has go been anywhere. Yep, Denver's been able to answer Boston runs with a couple of runs of their own. Again, Robarge in there and loses another faceoff. Eck now fires and scores. So Chris Eck wins the faceoff and gets the goal. And so where Anthony Kelly had two goals in the first quarter, now all of a sudden, Chris Eck, who was dominant two weeks ago, has a goal of his own. Gets the faceoff win, finds a lane, and he beat Jesse on the near side. For Chris Eck, his first goal of the season. And Anthony Kelly is back out. And this is where this is a win that Anthony Kelly needs to get because Chris Eck is going to be a little tired. Legs might be a little heavy. Troy Tulowitzki knows a little bit about that. Oh, Kelly won that one clean. Here he comes. Freight train. And the Outlaws will get set. Kimmerner comes into the game. Sieverts wants to come into the game and he'll wait his opportunity. That's Snyder. Chris Spocklitz out there. Now Sieverts joins. Mundorf. Snyder fires and scores! That was not an easy shot by any means. And Snyder with his third goal of the game. And that has not been Outlaws lacrosse this year. Most of their goals come on assists. In this case, Snyder gets kind of hung out to dry. No one to feed the ball to. So against Eck, he knows he's tired. He decides to take a shot and he beats Burke. And he beat Burke mid to high with a bullet. Snyder now with 10 goals on the season. Eight of them have come against Boston in two games. So there's something about a Cannons uniform that brings out the best in Drew Snyder. That was, that was a big goal for Denver. It was an important goal for Denver because they really needed to kind of 
stem that tide, that little mini run that Boston went on. I don't think Boston's going to go away. You know, a couple of weeks ago, while the teams are in a timeout, we'll take a break and come back with more Major League Lacrosse on YouTube, presented by Warrior. Last pick in the 2004 draft, Mr. Irrelevant is what they called me. They said I should just be honored to be drafted since I was a Division III player. But they don't know me. I don't do honored, and I certainly don't do irrelevant. Berger shoots, and he scores! I'm Steven Berger of the New York Lizards, and I powered through to become the 2012 MLL All-Star Game MVP. How do you power through? Back in Denver, Outlaws with a 17-11 lead over the Cannons. Boston just called a timeout. Face off, won by Denver. Infraction against Chris X, so here come the Outlaws again. Getting a goal to stop a mini 3-0 run by the Cannons. Here's Mundorf trying to feed Greer and will get a full penalty called as Mundorf was knocked down. Mitch Bilal did not like that at all. He thought it was just clean, hard lacrosse. It'll be interesting to see if his stick got it. Oh, yeah, he slashed him on the head. That was kind of soft, but I don't know. I didn't really. I've seen worse. They called. They, yeah, they called him on a hold. Technical thirty second. Denver will have to move quick here. Boy, Mundorf takes a beating, doesn't oh. he? Oh man, does he take a beating? But he gives as good as he gets. Now a man-up opportunity for the Outlaws' first one of the game for Denver. Boston one for one on their lone chance. They've inverted Sieverts and Bocklet. They'll have to get a little bit of action here. Oh, Greer finds Snyder, and Snyder whips around and scores again. And an angry Mitch Belisle coming back onto the field as his penalty led to a man-up goal for the Outlaws, and now an 18-11 lead. Greer with the look-off feed to Snyder. Snyder, I think, was surprised that, that Smalley didn't rough him up a little bit down in the crease. He had a lot of time to locate and shoot that. So, Ron, you wondered how this younger Outlaws team would handle the run by the veteran Boston team, and they've done very well. Two quick goals to answer the three goal run by the Cannons. Eck wins the face off over Kelly. Stays on. Oh, and that time, not able to score was Eck. Scramble, Cannons come away with it. Two point shot goes wide as Schwartzman was caught out of the cage and Dylan Roy stepped in to play goalkeeper. And I think Jesse might have got a little piece of that. He was way out of position. And now they've changed things up. They have Lee Zink on Rabel. That's a much better matchup from Denver's perspective. Here comes that vaunted transition attack from the Outlaws, spurred on by the quick pass from Schwartzman. Jim Stagnita telling me today that that's the part of Jesse's game that has improved the most as he's moved deeper into his career. Year six, seven, eight, really has a handle on 
getting rid of that ball fast and triggering the, the transition game the other way. He's always been one of the more accurate goalies in the league on the transition outlet throw. Throws BBs, but now he's finding guys who are in stride. And Denver's running their transition so they can get a couple of guys in stride and give Jesse a few targets to choose from. Kiminer's shot goes wide. Ball fought for. I like the way Denver's moving the ball offensively. Everybody's getting a touch. They're not holding it in their cradle too long. That jumps out at me, Ron, is that compared to maybe recent Outlaws teams, which had a ton of talent, but it was almost like, okay, this time down, it's your chance to go ISO one-on-one. -on -one. Next time down, it might be your chance. Seems like with this offense right now, everybody's getting a taste. And that's the best brand of lacrosse to watch. And it's also a lot of fun to play. Remember Shot. when they had Ryan Powell, then everything was an ISO? Yep. Shot clock is off, saved by Schwartzman. And they had to run it that way because all of their players were ISO players. Schwartzman going long. Oh, what a pass! Oh, what a save by Burke. That would have been a goal for the highlight reel as Schwartzman, Peyton, he threw a bomb that Peyton Manning would have been proud of and found Sieverts in stride. And Sieverts right now looking up at the sky. He can't believe it. Nor can Schwartzman. Oh, that was pretty. We'll have to take a look at that when we come back. End of the third quarter. It's the Outlaws leading the Boston Cannons 18 to 11. We've seen some Hail Marys here recently at uh, Mile High. We almost saw another one right there. Fourth quarter coming up next here on YouTube. be held in Philadelphia the weekend of August 24th and 25th. See the top four teams in the league battle in three games over two days to decide an MLL champion. For tickets 
and information, visit MajorLeagueLacrosse.com. Fourth quarter underway here in Denver. Mike Evans, Ron Zwerin, Outlaws up 18 to 11. Denver with the ball to start. Denver has outscored Boston by two in the first quarter, by four in the second quarter, and by two in the third quarter. Boston has to find a way to convincingly win a quarter. They're going to have to find a way to win one by eight goals. It's going to be difficult against a Denver team that has been dominating its opponents. Let's take a look back at this. This is the final seconds of the third quarter. Watch this play. Jesse Schwartzman to Sieverts. I mean, that is a laser. Oh, you know that those guys are going to give each other endless grief about that. Well, Jesse will give Sieverts endless grief about that. Look like Joe Flacco to Jacoby Jones. Ah. Ooh. Too, too, soon. Soon. <laughs> too soon. Too soon, Bronco fans. Too soon. Too soon. Too soon. That will, that will never be. Ah, I was mind. standing in the south end zone ah. where Denver is attacking right now. I was standing in the south end zone as Sieverts scores Set, again. Stop that story. <laughs> yeah, stop that story. Sieverts, 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 Sieverts didn't want to hear that story either. Third goal of the game, fourth point for Sieverts. Oh, actually, that might be a two-point shot. It was. It was a two-point shot. So for Sieverts, his second two-point goal of the night, five points for Sieverts on those three goals. Denver has had three two-point goals tonight. They had one through the first four games. Amazing. And, and, and I don't want to second-guess Coach Duffy on putting Burke between the pipes, but... He's not having one of his better games so far. I mean, these two-point shots have been coming from way outside the arc. What I'm suggesting is that normally those are saves that Burke would make. Burke, remember, coming off the injured list the last couple of weeks. Other Boston goalkeepers, Mike Gable has played the, got the bulk of the goalkeeping chores this year, but now Burke's the guy now that he's back healthy. Yes, Ron, it was. It was about uh, four degrees uh, it that wasn't, night. It wasn't that warm. <laughs> it was, man. I was it so was, cold. It was bitter Ugh. here that night. and Yep, can still see it. Heartbreaking loss for the Denver Broncos here, but... A lot of high expectations, boy. You talk about Super Bowl or bust in this city when it comes to the Denver Broncos. That is definitely the feeling with Peyton Manning and crew. And the owner of this team, Pat Bolin, who also owns the Denver Outlaws, he's thinking championship or bust as well. You know, when he went out and brought in the new regime of Jim Stagnita and company, he wanted to make sure that not only did they change the coaching, but they changed the culture. Because Denver's always been a great place to play because of the ownership and because of the people who manage the team. But it was a tough place to play because they couldn't seem to get over the hump. Oh, what a shot by Snyder. Another two-point goal. And Jordan Burke is seeing ghosts right now. He doesn't know which end is up, where the shots are coming from. This onslaught from Denver has him rattled. You can see it. Uh, you know, and I don't I don't see Gable warming up, but this shot, Mike, I mean, look how far out this shot comes from. I mean, that is a long way out. And I realized that Sweeney was sort of shadowing Burke, kind of just blocking him a little bit, so he might not have been able to get a clean look. But you have got to stop that. Drew Snyder, three weeks ago against Boston, five goals. Drew Snyder tonight against Boston, five more goals. Big night for Snyder. 
And now the Outlaws in complete control up 22 to 11. I mean, when they when they beat up on Rochester two weeks ago, you know Rochester's a young team. And so you thought maybe just Denver's speed, their experience, and some of their strengths up the middle and defensively were just too much for a young Rochester team. But for them to be up 11 on Boston, a team that is desperate, that needs this win. I mean, they need this win tonight. They don't want to fall to one and four. The standings right now in Major League Lacrosse, Denver coming into tonight. Denver and Hamilton both 4-0. Chesapeake 3-1, and New York 2-2. Two and two. And then you have Boston, Charlotte, and Rochester all at 1-3, and, and Ohio at 0-4. Oh so if Boston were to go on and lose this game, that drops them to 1-4. And, and you're right. I mean, now you're, starting, now you're starting to look at you know, at least two games behind in the loss column for that fourth and final playoff spot. I mean, Charlotte got a win tonight over New York, a 14 to 12 win. So they're two and three. New York is two and three. Ohio has the donut at 0 and four. Rochester at one and three. Boston gripping at one and three. Could they fall to one and four, Mike? I don't know if a Boston team has ever been one and four and then went on to make the playoffs. No team in Major League Lacrosse history has been 0-4 to make the playoffs. At least for now, keeping hope alive is Michael Stone, who scores his fourth of the game. Nice feed Cameron from Flint. Flint with the nice feed. Stone with the left-handed rake. And just beat Jesse on a clean goal. If Austin wants to get back in it, and they still can. They certainly can. They're going to have to go with a quickness. They're going to have to win every face off from here on out. And they're going to have to score and maybe sprinkle in a two-pointer here. Kelly gets called for an infraction. So back to the cannons. What I like so far about Denver is that they haven't let off the gas. You remember a couple of years ago we were covering that Chesapeake game and Denver had it in the bag. I mean, that was over. That game was over with four minutes left to play because Denver was up by seven goals and Chesapeake came and won that game in overtime. That crushed the Outlaws pretty much for the rest of the season. But this Outlaws team, what's different is that they are on the gas pedal and they are not pumping the brakes. Terrific, They're going right at it. Terrific play defensively by Roger Ferguson, the rookie from Brown. They love this kid. As he just plucked that pass right out of the air. They think that he is going to be a really nice player in this league. Might be able to kind of replace Steve Holmes, some of the defensemen who have been sort of staples here. Denver had some nice picks in the uh, college draft. Who's going to step out of the lineup? That's my question. Well, you know, the thing is, is that they can run Eric Law at midfield. I don't think Eric Law is going to see the field as an attack. But they might be able to run him as a transition player because some of the things that Denver's doing, offensively at least, is they're, they're stealing a lot from the indoor league. They're running a lot of OD transition, quick transition. Schwartzman with a good, clean look at that Rabel shot. Schwartzman putting together an unbelievable MLL career of his all time. He is top five all time in Major League Lacrosse. Oh, as that ball sneaks past Jordan. Actually now Burke has been pulled. Mike Gable is now in. But the problems continue between the pipes as Mundorf gets one. That's tough as a backup goalie. One shot, one goal. You don't get really a chance to warm up. And all of a sudden, a Brendan Mundorf shot. I mean, he can get it up to about 100 miles an hour. Was probably coming at about a good 85. Just skidded off the turf. See the spin on that one? Yeah. See the way the ball reacted? 
You can see the incredible spin he put on that as he went low off the ground, beat Gable, who was the goalie of record in the meeting between these two teams three weeks ago. But to finish your point about Law and the style of play that the Outlaws are employing. Yeah, I mean, I think that his style of play will lend him maybe to play in a little bit of transition. He'll kind of be a special teamer for the Denver Outlaws. Oh, good save by Schwartzman as a, a rare time you saw Lee Zink get beat that time by Boyle, but Schwartzman was there to bail him out. I think that Brian McGill, the defenseman from Syracuse, will play a lot. Um, I think that Brian McGill, I mean, he's a ground ball machine. And so you can always use those guys on face-offs. Could you imagine Brian McGill as well as Matt Bocklet on face-offs? I mean, two vacuums out there. Denver has not let off the gas, and you're right, Ron. There have been some Outlaws teams in the past, as good as they have been here at home, they've had those moments where just for about five or six minutes, they just kind of go to sleep a little bit. Yeah, they kind of clock out for a little while. Yeah, and let teams back into games, and usually that, whenever they lost here at home, the few times that they have, it would be because of that. They are not letting off these two-point shots. And you know what, I gotta tell you, as covering the, long, the Outlaws for a long time, I like this. I mean, I like. Oh, what a what pass. pass. What a pass from Mundorf to Kiminer. Pretty, Goal. pretty feed. I mean, this again is a no angle goal. Wow. Two shots, two goals. Outlaws putting on a display right now. Right now, the rest of the league is looking around Denver going, can't touch them right now. Not right now. trying the second swim move. This is not how I wanted to end my lacrosse career. I always thought I would go out on my terms. Everyone said I should just call it quits. It would be too hard to come back. But I didn't listen to everyone. I powered through. Grandly in charging and he scores! The beast! I didn't just come back. I was a 2012 MLL All-Pro. I'm Greg Grandly of the New York Lizards. How do you power through? Seconds left. Boyle outside the arc. Inside the pass. Quinzani. He scores! Max Quinzani with a buzzer beater. With seven and a half minutes left here in the fourth quarter, Denver comfortably ahead and. Coach Jim Stagnita has made a change in goal, giving backup Charlie Cipriano a chance to play and give Jesse Schwartzman the rest of the night off. Coach Dan Ross warming up Cipriano. There you see there, number 25 in between the break zone there. Second year player out of Fairfield. Just to finish up on Schwartzman, another big night for Schwartzman who Top five all time in MLL in wins, saves, goals against, games played. We remember him back when he was a rookie. And boy, he has just become one of the real staples here for the Denver Outlaws. Eighth year. And, and you know, when he, and when he came a rookie, you remember we were. Uh, he, when he came in, Trevor Tierney was the goalie. Yep, yep. And Trevor Tierney had to retire early because of concussions, and he went on to be, you know, a coach over with his dad over at Denver University. Done a fabulous job there. And, and, and people were wondering, you know, would Jesse 
be able to not be a knucklehead and really lead this team because his rookie year, he was kind of a knucklehead. But then all of a sudden, he kind of became this leader, and he is unquestionably a leader. It's so much fun, I think, Mike, to see players mature in front of your very eyes, see them in the game, mature, willing to they make mistakes and get better because of them. It, it's, just, it's just fun to watch. I mean, it's really fun to watch him sort of command this team and command the respect and really set a culture of openness and welcomeness and communication on this team. Well, that's what the uh, Outlaws have been able to do over the years. They, they've never been content, even with all the success that they've had during the regular season, all the wins they've racked up. They've always kind of not been content to go with the same roster every year, but yet, even though we see a lot of turnover, we see a lot of new faces every year, there, there's always been that bedrock of, of veterans that have always been here from Schwartzman to Zink uh, to Mundorf. I mean, you're talking about three guys who are all in their eighth, ninth year. And getting the goal is Will Manny, the rookie, his first MLL career goal as he beats Cipriano, the rookie from UMass. I like the way Will Manny plays lacrosse. He is going to be a nice, complimentary player in this league, I think for a long time, assuming he can stay healthy. Here's Rabel on the patent sweep, and Manny just in the right place. Notice how Manny was coming to meet the ball. He wasn't waiting for the ball to get to him. He was catching the ball in stride. That gave him a little extra better angle when he took the shot. Think uh, Will Manny ever dreamed of getting his first goal on a feed from Paul Rabel? Not bad, huh? Pretty high cotton. Not bad. Two-point goal. Ooh, oh, that one. Oh, oh. that's going to hurt. Oh. That two-point shot hit Chris O'Doherty. Oh. He's going to have a mark on that for the rest of the season. That might be there until September. Hard shot from Brian Farrell. But look at O'Doherty. He's up. Boy, that one had to sting. Woo. That thing was smoke. That thing was coming hard. He's got the adrenaline going right now, but you're right. He's going to wake up tomorrow morning. Go, what was that? Got a penalty called against Denver. 32nd man advantage now for the Cannons. One for one Boston on the man up. That's Downing, who will sit down. If you're Boston now, just fire away from two point. Well, yeah, I mean, at this point, I mean, you're you're on the man up. You want to at least get a goal, find a way to get a goal. But yeah, they're. I mean, this, Mike, I hate to say it, but this this one's over. I I, I don't see Boston coming back. I mean, normally I never say that in MLL, but this is going to be tough for them to come back. I think that Boston needs to start thinking about what the future is going to look like the rest of this season, because because in the game against. Chesapeake, what I saw from them was true grit. I mean, they were gritty in that game. They, they were not afraid to get grimy. They weren't afraid to get after it. And in this game, they haven't had a chance to get gritty. Denver has run them out of the gym. Pasque on the feed from Rabel. Jump shot, goal by Pasque. And for Pasque, that's his fourth goal of the game but too little too late for the Cannons. A little jump shot right by Cipriano. Cipriano and Gable have the same problem. Two goals, two shots. Quick timeout, back for the final 354 here from Denver.
ShopMLL.com is your destination for officially licensed Major League Lacrosse apparel. Get all your MLL team hats, t-shirts, shorts, hoodies, and more at ShopMLL.com. Keeping up with Major League Lacrosse has never been easier. Get all the latest news, highlights, and scores right to your smartphone with the MLL app for iPhone and Android. Download yours today. Back in Denver, Outlaws comfortably ahead, 24-14, as we are now under four minutes to go here. Denver on their way to improving to 5-0. And, oh. and Boston in danger now of dropping to one and four. And Steve Duffy was quite adamant when I talked to him earlier today. He said, as good as the win over Chesapeake was, we still are in a position where we're playing must win games. And tonight does not look like they're going to get the win. And this is, by the way, the start of a three game road trip. As next week they're at Rochester, then the week after that they're at Charlotte, before they come back home to play New York. So a critical juncture right now for the Cannons. I think the, the, that Boston can get those three wins. I think they're better than those, they're better than Charlotte, and they're better than Rochester at the present time as currently constituted. I think they can get those wins. I also think that they're just a little bit better than New York. Um, New York does have some new nice players um, namely, you know, New York has a nice bunch of kids coming in and playing for them. I think that New York's going to be a tough matchup for Boston, but I think Boston, as currently constituted, is the better team. So the reason why tonight's win was so important is because it would put them over that 500 mark and right in the thick of things. Next week, next Saturday, make sure you're right back with us here on YouTube as we'll be back here at Sports Authority Field at Mile High for the Outlaws and Hamilton, which is a enticing matchup as Hamilton going into this weekend's action, they're 4-0. Denver also 4-0 coming into tonight. They're gonna be 5-0, so potentially a battle of the unbeatens coming up next Saturday here in Denver. And we'll have it for you here on YouTube. And, and two teams that play similar lacrosse. You know, they want they you know these two teams will run a run. They'll play a lot of Canadian, a lot of invert. You know, if I was Jim Stagnita at this point, I would just pull Blunden Mundorf right out of the game. I'd say that's enough. Seen enough. Have a seat. Another strong game for Mundorf as he has scored three goals. Two for Kiminer. Sieverts has three goals, including two of them, two-point goals. Zach Greer with three goals, but our Brian player of the game, and we'll talk to him right after this game, is Drew Snyder with five goals, one of them a two-pointer. And boy, has he feasted on the Boston Cannons. Two games in the span of three weeks, 10 goals against the Cannons. Ho-hum. I, I like the way Denver has trusted their young guys to get better over the course of time. They are a team, an organization that believes in cultivating youth. Jim Stagnita is a great teacher of the game. And the other thing that I like about what the Outlaws are doing is that Jim Stagnita, BJ O'Hara, and company are not afraid of adjusting to the major league process. You know, these guys came from college, at least Jim Stagnita did, and normally in college it's really run by the coaches. Slow things down, check with me, methodical. In Major League Lacrosse, there's no time for that. But he's been able to let guys go out and invert, play styles that they're comfortable with, as long as they do some of the fundamental things that he wants them to do. You think about the, the, the balance you try to strike, because you're right, this whole coaching staff, you know, right up to general manager Tony Seaman, I mean, you're talking about long time very successful coaches college coaches all of them and they've been able to bring that college sense of player development that you're talking about but yet also understand 
that the MLL game is just different from the college game. So they've been able to find that good mix of player development, but yet also adapting their college backgrounds to the pro game. And, and I think the other thing they've done really well is they've been able to say no to players. You know, there have been some players that 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 wanted to dictate terms. Um, and, and I'm not saying that Drew Westervelt or that Max Sebald or that uh, you know any of these other players they've let go in the last couple of years have been dictating terms, but they did want to play kind of closer over on the East Coast. And so the Outlaws said, okay, fine. You want to go there, we'll make it happen. And they've made good deals along the way to better their team. Oh, what a save by Cipriano. <laughs> he gets thrown to the turf for his troubles by Michael Stone. Under a minute to go. Shot Outlaws. clock is off. Up 24. This will make back-to-back -back home games. First two home games of the season for the Outlaws. 20 points against Hamilton and, or excuse me, 20 points against Rochester, and now 24 against Boston. I, I, I'm just, I, I gotta tell you, you know, at the beginning of the game, you and I were chatting about this, and I thought it would be a close game. I am stunned that Denver was able to get a 10-point win here tonight. Because I do have a lot of respect for the way Boston plays the game. I mean, they play the game right. They play with a lot of grit. But they just didn't have a chance to get even any, into any kind of a rhythm tonight. Rabel playing hard right to the end. And the final seconds will tick off. That's it. The Denver Outlaws with an impressive display before the home fans as they hammer Boston 24 to 14, handing Boston their first ever loss here in Denver. Cannons had been a perfect 5 and 0. Denver gets the win to improve to 5 and 0. Boston with the loss, Steve Duffy's team now at 1 and 4 and some serious soul searching going on for the Cannons right now. We'll talk with our Brian player of the game. Drew Snyder coming up here in just a moment. Leading scorers was Snyder with five goals. Three for Zach Greer, three for Jeremy Sieverts, three for Brendan Mundorf, two for Terry Kiminer, and another strong night between the pipes for Jesse Schwartzman. Lee Zink with his typical all-world defensive performance. We saw some of the uh, new young guns for the Outlaws with Justin Turry had a couple of goals. Chris Bocklet, Greer, Snyder, whew, a lot of talent, a lot of talent on this Denver team, and they had it all on display tonight. You know, Mike, I'm really trying to think back to some of these other teams that we've covered over the years that have started off strong, that we were saying, man, if they could just keep doing this, and, and there's been a number of them, so I don't want to get too ahead of the, the cart here and start saying that this is the best Outlaws team that I've ever seen, but for whatever reason, they look different to me than in previous iterations of the Outlaws. They look a little bit faster up the middle to me. Um, aside from the Sonky Sim Sims years where they were just big and fast everywhere, this team looks like those teams from the early, um, early Outlaw years. And so the question is, do they have the right mix? Do they have enough depth? Because as the dog days start coming around, you know, we get into June, July, it starts getting hot. Guys start getting tired, wearing down. Do, do they have enough? I'm not so sure that Boston does. I think this might be one of those down years for Boston. And they've got some older players and they have questions that they're gonna have to start answering. You know, Ryan Boyle, is, as great of a player as he is, he is getting older. Um, you're gonna have to get Paul Rabel some help. You can't let Paul Rabel take the beating that he takes week in and week out and expect to have him upright towards the end of the season. Boston has some questions. Denver looking good right now. And, and this is what the Outlaws do. They they win during the regular season. Yeah. I mean, since they entered the league back in 06, they just win. They win over 72% of their games. So uh, there, there's, there's no surprise that Denver's doing what they're doing. And now it's just a matter of what they do come playoff time. Let's visit with our prime player of the game. Drew Snyder joins us now. And Drew, what is it about you playing Boston? Two games in the span of about three weeks, you scored 10 goals against them. Yeah, uh, nothing special, um, to tell you the truth. It's just uh, we're playing outlaw lacrosse. Uh, we had a good practice um, yesterday. 
and uh, just transferred over into the game. So we're very pleased with the win. You know, Drew, a lot of your teammates have been saying they've been very impressed by the way you have really stepped up your game this year. There are a lot of young guys who are going to be watching this game as you're getting the business here yeah. <laughs> in the line, which you deserve because you're the player of the game, so that's fine. Um, but a lot of young guys are going to be watching you, and they're going to be wondering, what, how, how did he improve? Um, just practice. You know, practice makes perfect. And um, I'm coaching a high school lacrosse team right now, uh, Nathan Hale Raiders. We actually have a state championship game tomorrow, and um, that allows me to have my stick in my hand um, pretty much every day. So um, just those extra reps that I get um, during practices with them, and um, it's, it helps out, and uh, I guess you saw it today. Drew, Ron and I have been covering the Outlaws for, for several years now, and we can't recall a team that, that shared the ball and moved the ball, and everybody seems to get a, a touch or taste during the course of the game. Uh, obviously, that's by design, but how difficult is it to, to go out and execute it? You guys make it look easy. Yeah, well, it's easy when you, you keep the ball hot. You know, if you, if you don't uh, keep the ball on somebody's sticks too long and um, you move it, you dodge, you move it again, you look inside, nothing's there, you move it. Um, you saw it with Duke this um, during the national championship. They were playing great lacrosse, and they were keeping that ball hot, sharing it, and um, it's just a team offense. That's what that good offense is. You go next week, you have Hamilton coming in, and you guys are right there at the top of MLL. When you look at a Hamilton team, what is it that th this team is going to have to do in order to get a win next week? Um, well, we just got to come prepared, you know. Uh, every every week, there's so many good players in this league, and if we just can stay focused and uh, and play our lacrosse, we'll, we'll be good. Our prime player of the game, Drew Snyder. Drew, congratulations. Congra uh, good luck to Nathan Hills. The, Na uh, Nathan Hill lacrosse. All right. Go Raiders. Congratulations. Good luck tomorrow. Thank, Thank you. you. Drew Snyder, our prime player of the game and what a display what a performance by him and the rest of the outlaws we'll take a time out come back and wrap this one up the final from denver outlaws 24 boston 14.
Bruins with a convincing 24-14 win over Boston and celebrating with their fans. Once again, as always, Denver leading the league in attendance. And why not when you get to watch a team that wins over 70% of the, their games, come on out and watch some good winning lacrosse. Mike Evans, Ron Zwerin, and Ron, we've watched a lot of talented outlaw teams over the years. Could this be the best of the bunch? Well, not to go Denny Green on you, but I'm not going to crown him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm not going to crown him. But but they're good, and, and, and they're deep. And, and I like how they've made some adjustments to this team. They've gotten big and strong and fast up the middle. Uh, conversely, look at the Boston Cannons, and there are some holes in that ship. Uh, they're going to have to get some help from Paul Rabel. He can't do it all as good as he is. Well, we'll be back here on YouTube next week from Denver for a, a great one uh, as the Outlaws take on Hamilton, both teams undefeated. Once again, our final score is 24-14 for Ron Zwerin and our entire crew here in Denver. I'm Mike Evans. For highlights of this game and all your MLL videos, subscribe to the MLL YouTube channel. And for all your Major League Lacrosse news, visit MajorLeagueLacrosse.com. This has been a presentation of Lax United Marketing and Major League Lacrosse. Good night from Denver.